Thank you very much. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you uh, to Boris and to Horst for uh, inviting me. Uh, as Boris said, I came here for the first time uh, last year and had a totally amazing time, met loads of brilliant, interesting people. Uh, so when they asked me to come back this time and actually to program uh, a few speakers, um, I absolutely jumped at the chance. So um, this afternoon we have uh, a few uh, independents who I'll be kind of coming on and introducing, uh, and then you'll see me a bit more through the weekend with some other uh, independent people. Um, but so with this talk, I really want to use it to try to give, um, I guess, kind of an overview. So we'll take a, take a bit of a look at independent publishing in general, because we're in this place where we have this fantastically exciting moment for independent magazines. Um, and that brings with it lots of really great positive things, but also uh, quite a few challenges. So I'm going to kind of like range far and wide, kind of independent, small around the world, uh, and then hopefully in... 25 minutes time, <laughs> I'm just marking that now, it's five past, okay. Uh, I'm going to try and leave you with like five, uh, a conclusion of five things, basically, to try to sort of like uh, say what I think is the crux of the independent magazine world at the moment. Before I do that, anyone who was here last year will know that I like to start these things with a show of hands. So, um, who here already knew what Stack was? Good, excellent. Leave your hand in the air if you subscribe. Yes! <laughs> excellent, love it. I'm hoping for some more of those by the end. Um, so for the rest of you... Uh, nope. For the rest of you, Stack is this. Um, every month we send out a different independent magazine. You never know what you're going to get next, but you do know it's going to be a beautiful, intelligent magazine that you probably wouldn't have seen before. Um, these are all uh, like pictures taken by Stack subscribers. Um, and this is kind of like sort of my favorite point in the month because you sort of like you send these magazines out kind of all around the world. And then a few days later, you start seeing kind of like people photographing the outpost next to their cats. or Actually, cats figure quite strongly in the pictures that people send. People do kind of like crazy sort of punny things. So uh, just so that you can see, put an egg on it, a, a food mag from Brooklyn. And you can see someone's very cleverly put an egg on it. Um, so pe people do this. I mean, the, so people have always kind of uh, sent pictures and like sort of commented, saying, "Oh, hey, my my magazine's here." Um, but then a, a couple of years ago, I started incentivizing it, and now we publish our top ten pictures every month, and the, the, like, our favorite one uh, wins a stack T-shirt. And stack T-shirts can only be like you can't buy them; you have to get them by doing a good thing, um, and people properly compete for them. So like the um, it's a lot of fun. I, I really enjoy it. Um, I've also been very lucky um, because I started Stack uh, eight years ago, and it was very much a hobby. It was just something that, you know, I loved these magazines, wanted to get them out into the world. It was kind of like, you know, evenings, weekends, one day a week. Um, and Stack has really kind of ridden the wave of these independent magazines. And so uh, a couple of years ago, I was able to go full time on it. Um, uh, in September last year, uh, I was able to employ Stina, who is uh, the first full time uh, member of staff. Um, so it's kind of like, it's, it's this really exciting time. I just I feel very lucky to have kind of like caught the same wave. As, as independent publishing, because the, this is something that... Now, this one's not working. <laughs> okay. Is this one there? All right. I'm not sure if there's a delay or maybe something. Um, so, th so this is the reality of independent magazines today. So these are a bunch of uh, independent magazine shops, uh, all in the UK. Um, and you can see here that, um, the, so there's a couple kind of like, there's Magma over there, which has been around for about 10 years or so. Artwords just above it also, kind of like 10 years or so. But all the rest of these shops have opened in the last couple of years. And I think it's so exciting that, you know, kind of to, to see a physical manifestation of the popularity of these magazines and the existence of these magazines is that you've got all these small independent businesses opening up around the country, you know, in cities like kind of Nottingham, Leeds, like th these are not places that 
you get like tons of like you know trendy shops with like beautiful lighting and, and all the rest of it. So it's really exciting for me to see the way that these independent magazines are spreading out into a wider kind of independent ecosystem. And that's all thanks to technology. So the print magazines often get kind of like put in opposition to technology because there's an assumption that, well, you know, technology is the internet and, you know, sort of like everything's going to, to digital. But of course, anyone who's involved in making magazines knows that technology has massively democratized magazine publishing. When I started like 15 years ago, I had to work for a big newspaper or magazine publisher because that was the way to get your stuff out to an audience. Now that just it's not necessary. It's just it's not the case anymore. So basically, whether it's because, you know, uh, five years ago, six years ago, whatever it was, Kickstarter launched and gave everyone a way to just, like, get the funds and a community behind a project. It was revolutionary. A few years ago, when Adobe switched everything to Creative Cloud, so then for, like, 30-odd pounds a month, you're using the same tools as, like, the guys at Condé Nast. It's revolutionary, overnight stuff. But no one ever really talks about it. So it's been this massive like, invigoration of, of the, the independent of, of publishing in general. <laughs> the problem for me <laughs> with this talk is that means there's bloody loads of stuff to talk about. Um, so the, like, kind of, you know, when I started like, to think about how am I going to kind of rationalize this and which mags am I going like, to talk about, I had to have a, kind of, like, a, a think about which ones to pick. And, and also, it's not just that. Independent magazines have a particular... <laughs> All right, I'm just going to use the computer. Yeah, there we go. Um, <laughs> okay, all right, thank you. Uh, a bit stronger. Okay, sorry, I have such delicate thumbs. I was really... Um, okay. <laughs> the problem with independent magazines, I was going to say, is that they're so bloody independent. You know, the, like in, in, in the mainstream, we know what a travel magazine looks like. A travel magazine has got uh, a lovely swimming pool on the cover or a beach, maybe, and it's got some recommendations inside for lovely places to go, and it's got some advertising that's all built around that. We know what we're dealing with. In the independent world, that just doesn't exist. These independent magazines are mainly started... They're, they're, they're sort of, when you speak to the, the publisher of these magazines, you know, they're not doing it for money. The, the, in the main part, like, it's a very difficult thing to make a business of these magazines. One of the common themes that comes through is that people are making these magazines as a response to the mainstream because they're seeing the stuff that's out there. They're seeing the travel magazines, for example, um, that you know, kind of are on the shelves on the high streets. And that they're saying, like, this doesn't reflect my life. So you've got a, a magazine like Lodestar's Anthology over there, which actually as they go, is kind of one of the sort of like more traditional uh, takes on travel by an independent magazine. So they head off to a different destination each issue and present lovely photos and stuff. You've got Serial, which also, like, you know, kind of Serial's been an absolute phenomenon. Um, and again, like, you know, sort of, they, they pride themselves on going to these places. But then with Serial, so much of it is the aesthetic and the particular view that they have of the world. I mean, so this, this issue here is the San Fran sorry, the, the California uh, issue, or the, the one when it's California. Um, that is probably the least iconic photo of the Golden Gate Bridge you'll ever see. So this is kind of like their very particular aesthetics, their way of seeing the world. But then you kind of get something like Boat, and you see that, well, I mean, all bets are off. So this is a travel magazine that goes to a different city each issue, connects with local creatives there to make this like fantastic kind of insider outside a perspective of a place. So this is the stuff that I find really exciting. But it carries on, because then you add in other complexities. So you could say, well, what about if we mix travel with coffee? That's Drift. So Drift magazine is all about going to a different city and experiencing the coffee culture of that place and understanding what that means about a place. And it's fantastic. It's so, like, they really get into kind of like the personal history of a place and kind of the, the, the sort of the social history, as well as just kind of like, hey, here's a nice cafe to go to. This is the uh, Havana issue, which has just come out. In Havana, um, because coffee is rationed, uh, it's split uh, with um, like dried beans or something. So like kind of you, like all your coffee in Havana is kind of like uh, ameliorated, adulterated. Um, 
then there's ambrosia. So this is travel and food made by the same guy. Uh, ambrosia travels around the world to different regions and interviews chefs. So what better way to find out about a region than by talking to its chefs because they're full of kind of like the culture and history of a place. Then you can add in like the, the, the geography. So uh, you've got Lost magazine. Then we're going to have Nelson uh, from Lost is going to speak later. So that's a, a travel magazine based in Shanghai. Or then you get Sidetracked down here, which is a travel magazine based in Worcester, which is a very long way from Shanghai. But the, you know, again, whereas in the mainstream, you have geographic splits. So a publisher will publish a magazine for a specific region. You know, the, the, if you're in, in Shanghai, you're publishing for people in China. These independent magazines, it's a global, it's a global um, industry. There are people all over the world who want to get this stuff. And it doesn't end there because then you add in the, the weird kind of like very conceptual stuff. So Flaneur, I'm sure many of you know, kind of the, the idea is go to a different city each time, focus on a specific street and what the people on that street are doing and get this kind of like real sort of like cultural, anthropological art project beautiful thing out of it. Brewster, I talked about last time, uh, is a travel magazine that travels through space and time. So they came up with this fantastic thing where if you get these old um, uh, sort of like 3D images that used to be viewed by looking through a little set of kind of binoculars, um, you take those images, you put them into Photoshop, tweak up the red and the green, put them together, again, people modern 3D glasses, and you get all these like old uh, travel images from sort of like the 19th century, which you bring to life in modern 3D. So all these magazines, kind of like they are all travel magazines. They're all independent travel magazines, but the, you could never put them on a shelf next to each other and say, there you go, there's your travel. So this, this is kind of, this is the problem I faced when putting the, the day together today. And so I decided, Stack is a filter. Stack acts to kind of filter out the best bits and deliver them to you. So let's use Stack as the way to organize this. So I'm going to talk to you today uh, about Stack, which is the thing I've been doing for eight years, and it's kind of grown and grown. Sampler, which is a new service that we launched uh, last summer. Uh, and then the Stack Awards, which we, uh, again, launched for the first time last year. Um, so I'm going to kind of like pick up on, on various magazines that have had something to do with those things. So beginning with Stack, that's kind of the backbone. That's sort of like, you know, that's where I, that's what everything comes from for, for what I do. Um, these are the magazines we sent out over the last 12 months. Uh, you can see uh, we sent out the Recorder, which is a typography magazine. So the Recorder's been published by Monotype for 100 odd years, uh, kind of on and off. But uh, a year ago, I think maybe a year and a half ago, uh, they kind of like, they, they relaunched it and relaunched it in the kind of, in the shape of this like independent publishing renaissance. And so you can see like the big typography on the front, the like sort of very impactful, very lovely paper stocks and stuff like that. So you can see that, you know, even when we break this down to just the, ma just the magazines we sent out over the last 12 months, there's still too much for me to pick from. So I decided to go back to basics and look at what the stack subscribers um, want. So this is a survey that we ran uh, to, well, Actually, a little, a little while ago now, I meant to do one last year, was too busy. I'm going to do a survey this year, definitely. Um, you can see that no one wants to be my friend. 18% um, of people, I, I'm all like, yeah, can we, can we run this together, right? This is like, no, no, we don't want to be your friend. Just give us the magazines, that's it. Uh, the value for money is surprisingly low as well. So the, the, because I buy in bulk with Stack, um, they're roughly half price. So, um, and there's a discount code coming at the end folks, so, uh, so watch out for that. But that, that's kind of not really what people are interested in. The big thing that everyone, almost everyone, um, really responded to is the surprise each month. So the, it's this idea of kind of like, it's not just getting a magazine, it's getting a surprise um, through the door. And when I started thinking of it like that, it made it a bit easier. Um, I decided to talk about the lifted brow. So we sent this out in January. <coughs> And it's surprising for a bunch of different reasons. Um, you might just be able to read there. Um, it's a quarterly attack journal from Australia and the world. Um, this is a literary magazine, first and foremost, literary and arts magazine, very politicized, very kind of like um, engaged and really wanting to kind of like to make change in Australia and, and beyond. And for me, the things that sort of make it special are the, first of all, the way that um, 
it wants to empower new voices. It wants to give people a voice who don't traditionally have. So you can see that top left spread up there is the opening spread to um, a project they did with the Refugee Art Project. So obviously, in Australia, uh, immigration is a hot potato as it is kind of everywhere else, I guess. Um, this is a, a group of people who work with uh, refugees, uh, getting them to create artworks that kind of express the situation they're in and try to sort of like break down some of the borders and the barriers that, that exist between people. That's the kind of story that the Lifted Brown wants to tell. Or even just kind of like down here in the bottom right hand corner, which I know you won't be able to see, but that sort of like that black bar there, that's kind of like a, like a, a mini fiction piece. So like as you sort of like turn the pages, that little area was reserved for this guy. And so you found kind of like just another nice sort of entry point into the page, which kind of like once you realize what it's doing and what it's there for, gives you like a whole different way of experiencing it. So this for me is kind of a magazine that wants to surprise you. It wants to put different things in front of you. And for the majority of Stack subscribers who are here in the Northern Hemisphere, this is a surprise just because it's even here. I mean, the, the really exciting thing for me is that with this, because Stack's kind of like now, we have just under 3,500 subscribers, which is tiny, completely tiny, but when you think of the mags that we're dealing with, a lot of these magazines might only have a, a print run of like a couple of thousand. So that's kind of like, that's, that means something to them. So with this one, rather than having them to uh, print it in Australia and ship it over here, we actually printed a run just for Stack in London. And this is something that we're able to do more and more. So we're able to actually bring magazines that you wouldn't actually see if you were living like here or, or in London um, and put them in front of people. Um, I also wanted to kind of like, well, so I started looking into the survey and I was like, oh my God, there's loads of interesting stuff here. <laughs> I should have done something with this. Um, so the, the, in terms of talking about kind of the experience of, of Stack for people, um, I thought it was really interesting that kind of, you know, you see people like, so almost nobody, when their Stack magazine arrives, they leave it with the rest of the post. I love the fact that for, for the people, for the subscribers, this is, these magazines are not post. There's something more special than that. And the most popular answer is, I carefully put it somewhere safe so I can come back to it and I've got more time. And for me, one of the nicest um, examples of that came with the lifted brow. So this is a subscriber. It just so happens that in the UK, uh, as I say, we sent lifted brow in January. Um, and they arrived, the first ones arrived with subscribers uh, on the same day that David Bowie died. Um, and this is a subscriber who has, uh, he's very keen to point out this is not done digitally. He's cut out paper and stuff and created the lifted Bowie um, and then written a little poem, the countdown done, the brow lifted, the strange face, the earth shifted. And I just saw that, I was like, this, that's completely beautiful. This is like, you know, people talk about the serendipity of magazines because you never know what's on the turn of the page. But with Stack, you never know what magazine's going to come next. So it kind of kicks up that sort of that interest. Um, and this guy won a T-shirt. Um, so that's, that's what you have to do. To win a T-shirt, you have to cut up a magazine and make a poem, and then you, you could win something. Um, OK, I'm going to have to go quickly through the rest of this. So Sampler, we launched uh, in the early summer last year. Sampler is all about using digital to sell prints. So it was really interesting hearing Mark talk about kind of like how he works sort of like between the, the different media. Um, for me, I'm interested in how you can use the power of, uh, of the web, and especially like people on phones, to actually sell these, these print objects. So every Thursday, uh, an email goes out. I checked, and it went this morning. And Sampler is live now. It's happening. Uh, it's sampler.stackmagazines.com. Uh, today's offer is the Collective Quarterly, uh, which is a beautiful mag from, Austra uh, from the US. Um, and Sampler was designed to address two specific problems that publishers have. Everybody knows when you publish magazines that you've got several thousand copies sitting somewhere in a warehouse. So you send your email out and you're like, hey, new issue, buy a copy. And people go, yeah, yeah maybe, maybe next week, yeah, not sure. And then you've lost them, that's it. So with Sampler, we only, have, we only ever have a very limited number of copies. And you can see that kind of black bar underneath the order button. That's like a progress bar showing how many copies are left. So if you want to buy through this, you have to do it now before somebody else gets it. So it's kind of introducing some kind of scarcity. 
There's also a problem that when you're buying a magazine, so this one, because Sampler has 10% off on all uh, cover prices, so uh, to buy Weapons of Reason from their site, it costs six pounds. But to mail Weapons of Reason to the US, it's probably going to cost you another five pounds. So because Stack is working at volume, sending out a lot of mail, I'm able to use that to give free shipping to the UK, US, and Europe. So it takes away another of these hurdles. So basically, for most of you people in this room, you can get an email, you can see that like, you know, maybe it's something of interest for you, buy it at 10% off and get it delivered for free. It's constantly trying to make it easier for people to do this. And then this is kind of like the, if you were to scroll down the site, you see sort of like the little persuader. So you've got the, the basic information at the top, some spreads that you can scroll through there, a little blurb about why this magazine matters, why you might like it, um, and a few sort of like simple bits of, of like the contents, basically. All designed to get people to order a copy, all designed to get people to try a new magazine. It's so easy to just stick within the things that you know, but Sampler's trying to get you to try new stuff. Weapons of Reason has been our most successful one so far. Uh, we sold 200 copies in a day and a bit. Um, and I think that that sort of says a lot about what people want from these independent magazines, because the, there's an assumption with independents often that you know, kind of they look really cool, they look lovely, but there's not much to read in there. That's not the case. And so with Weapons of Reason, it's all about taking a big issue. So this one is population, uh, and specifically megacities. And then telling stories from all around the world, beautifully, uh, beautifully illustrated to kind of like make them accessible. If you look at the, um, the oh, I can't get back. OK, if you look at any of these, you can see there's almost sort of like a kind of children's book sort of look to it to make it seem like these big, quite difficult subjects just seem like very easy to get, hold, to get your head around. But I don't just want to talk about the successful ones. So um, Hello Mister was uh, one of the offers that we, we ran last year. And we only sold like 30 odd copies of it, which I understand. So Hello Mister is a gay magazine. If someone sent me an email on a Thursday morning saying there's a gay magazine there, how about it? My first response would be, well, I'm not a gay man, so no, I'll leave that alone, thanks. But the whole point of putting it on Sampler is that there's so much more there to it. There's so much there that rewards. There's kind of the, this, um, the top left spread there is a very typical kind of approach. They have this very sort of like, they're trying to negotiate what it is to be a gay man in this kind of like most beautiful, heartbreaking writing that you'll ever come across. So, the, so for me, kind of like there's a lot there in terms of like the value that's within the magazine that people will just sort of like knee jerk turn off because they're like they're, they think the magazine's not for them. But then the other thing that it makes me think is actually Sampler needs to go beyond this, ma this mailing list. So, you know, kind of at the moment we hit a lot of people who are into graphic design, editorial, that kind of stuff. With like Facebook advertising, for example, we should be able to get this magazine in front of the audience that's exactly right for it. So that's something that we're kind of experimenting with at the moment and playing with. I find Facebook the most confusing thing in the world, but um, I, I have faith that we're going to get there and do this. Um, and it's really important that we do because this is something that's coming up. That I think there's something, <clears throat> there's something about these magazines that, you know, again, as Mark was saying, you can control every nuance. You can control the size, the weight, the smell, like every little bit of it. And these magazines seem to be a particularly good forum for people to talk about gender, sexuality, in this way that, like, we're just seeing, like, absolutely flowering. You know, the... To me, gender still feels like a male-female thing. But for the majority of these magazines here, that's absolutely not the case. This is a, tr a big trend that we're seeing in, in independent magazines. It's this kind of like renegotiation of gender and sexuality. And I'd love to think that Sampler could be a, a way to help more people discover magazines like this. And finally, the Stack Awards. Um, there is a very faint pink flash in the background. I've got no idea why, but projectors hate it, so you, you can't see it. On a screen, it looks, it looks fine. Uh, we started this last year because we wanted to give independent magazines a real awards scheme. So I, I've been involved with stuff before, which tends to boil down to me, Jeremy Leslie, a bunch of other people, 
talking on an afternoon and saying, which mags have been really great this year? Let's recognize them. Or you put it to the public vote, and then it just becomes kind of who's got the most Twitter followers, and they're the ones that win the, the award. With this, I want it to be like proper, a real thing. So we got a fantastic panel of judges from all around the world. Um, made sure it's accessible. So magaz uh, yeah, magazine awards programs tend to be a way of making money, so they're fairly expensive to enter. We made this £30 to enter, so kind of anyone could. Uh, and then to come to the party, it was £20, so again, anyone can come there. We just want this to be about the best magazines, not who can pay for it. We made it responsive to their needs, so we had like uh, photography and illustration categories, so best uh, use of photography, best uh, illustration. And they started out being, I just wanted the magazine publishers to talk about one illustrator or photographer and realized halfway through that they didn't want to do that. They wanted to show all the photography or all or have, have it considered holistically in the magazine. So we changed the rules halfway through to better fit what they needed. And we made real actual awards um, and we provided um, booze and food, um, which doesn't normally happen with independent stuff. Um, and this was the result. So um, you can probably just see there the the award ended up looking a bit like a PlayStation, which was um, a disappointment. <laughs> but, you know, we're working on that for this year. Uh, so uh, this is uh, Ibrahim from The Outpost, who you will see later on today. Uh, the Outpost is a fantastic magazine published out of Beirut, all about kind of the, the challenges faced by the Arab region, but refusing to come at it from the kind of like the, the, the conventional perspective. So it's a magazine of optimism, but like, you know, really clear eyed. Um, the, the, the stuff that I love about this, so the, I should say actually Ibrahim and the Outpost won the stack subscribers vote. So that's kind of like, you know, the reader's choice basically. And it really made me happy about stack subscribers because this is not a terribly easy magazine. So the, they come up with kind of like uh, the, the top left spread there. This issue is themed around the body, uh, and they came up with these kind of like metaphors for the body's various systems. So I think that plant is the respiratory system and kind of stuff like that. So they deliberately throw things in that are a little bit tricky and unusual and unexpected, but for me kind of give it this beautiful humor. So like while you're talking about people who've been bombed out of their houses or people who are oppressed because of their sexuality, or I seem to be going on a real sexuality thing at the moment. I don't know why. Um, they, st they come at it with this like, wonderful lightness and, and humor and gentleness that I think is, like, is really important. Um, we also had uh, The Victory. So this is a, a sports magazine uh, based in New York. Uh, unfortunately, they couldn't be with us on the night. So um, I managed to get the award to them uh, in Brooklyn. And they sent this video literally on the morning that we were having the award ceremony. It had been like Thanksgiving weekend and that award had been sitting in JFK for like four days or something. I was pulling my hair out. Um, but we managed to get them like, on a street in New York with like, cars honking. And I'm going, hey guys, thanks for the award, so we can be there. So it like, made it feel genuinely like, wow, this thing is big, it's all around the world. And the thing I love about Victory is that the scale of the thing, it's this great big magazine. So this is their Heroes and Villains issue. And that picture of Mario Balotelli, if it were on the back of the sun, at kind of that size, would just look like, oh, okay, Mario Balotelli's diving again, like, you know, pretending. But at this scale, it's like, he's a villain. It blows it up to this, like, these massive proportions. And that's something they do for the whole magazine. So they, like, run, like, proper, um, in-depth, long-form stuff. That's a piece about football in Northern Ireland at the top there. Um, they have, like, much more kind of graphic novel kind of led stuff. So it's an amazing story about the legend of Panthergirl, who was a female wrestler who got shot and nearly killed, but, like, came back and stuff. Amazing, amazing work. Um, and then we've got the winner. So uh, this is Dave from the Gourmand. Uh, the Gourmand, a, a food and drink magazine. And for me, it's just like an amazing example of what independence can be. So again, it's this, the, this assumption that like, you know, independence are maybe a bit amateurish or you know, kind of not the case. So they have like, you know, a piece with Steve Albini, the producer. Like it turns out Steve Albini's really into his food, so he kind of like takes him into the studio, talks about what he's doing. Beautiful kind of like set piece photography. Um, lovely illustration, Jean-Julien, the man of the moment. Like it's, I think it's the rule, if you make an independent magazine, Jean-Julien has to be in it somewhere. Um, but it's, it's just, again, like showing that the quality levels are absolutely up there. So those five things I promised you at the beginning, 
First of all, independent does not equal good. It's very easy when I stand up here and get excited about independent magazines to make it look like everyone making independent mag's got a great thing. Not the case. The majority of independent magazines could be a lot better. This is all about recognizing the best ones, recognizing what's the best about those best, and then trying to promote that and push that out there. The genie is out of the bottle. This is like, we keep getting the, this question come up, kind of like, is, is this the, you know, is this like peak independent magazine? We're going to start going down now. I just think this is like every other medium. You know, kind of like TV, video, music, everything. Everyone's making their own stuff, experimenting, producing their own things. This, I think, is only going to continue. Readers want quality. It goes to all the stuff I've been saying about, you know, all the magazines doing the best of the best. And ideas are exciting. With all these magazines, you can describe in like a sentence what's the thing that's special about them. But they need to spread. You know, it's not enough. It's not good enough for these magazines just to be within their little kind of niches and cliques and people with trendy haircuts reading them. They need to get out to a broader audience and actually really have an impact on the world. That's what we're going to be spending the next year doing. Um, you can follow us at Stack Magazines uh, on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, that is the discount code I promised you. So with QVED16, uh, you get 10% off a Stack subscription. Um, please subscribe. It keeps us all running. Um, and I'm looking forward to sending out more great mags. <laughs> Thank you very much, Steve. <laughs> Only five minutes. Okay, okay. It's okay, it's okay. Um, one more time, it's very interesting to see all these often unknown magazines. And mm -hmm. for me, you are lit something like a truffle pig. Truffle pig? <laughs> yes, you know this expression? It's from German. Okay. Trüffelschwein. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> 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 uh, Uh, two years ago, we had a, a, a session about erotic magazines. Mm -hmm. Do you think that is still a trendsetter in, in the magazine, in the independent magazine scene? There, I mean, there are, there are erotic mags out there. Like I said, there's a big theme at the moment of sexuality more generally. Um, so, I mean, I can think of there's a magazine called Math, which has just come out in the US. Okay. Which has like a completely like boring front cover and just like math across the top. Okay. But the whole idea is that you can read it like sort of in public and it's got all sorts of filth inside, but like no one knows because <laughs> you've <laughs> you got this super boring front cover. And um, so yeah, that, that is definitely still there. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Now we have to say thank you to him for all his travel pig word work. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we will make a small uh, break. 25 minutes, and after this we will start again with Ibrahim Neme. You told him something about him. Yes, thank cool. you very much. Also, kleine Sache noch. <laughs>